Good morning. My apologies for my lateness. I had to do without the blazer. It is just too warm today. Um, let's see. We have seems we have a quorum. We have the mayor's office. We don't have anyone from the council president's office. Are we expecting anyone from the council president's office? Okay. Well, let's get started and we'll see uh, whether or not the absence of anyone from the council president's office turns out to be an issue. Good morning. My name is Bill Henry. I'm the councilman for the fourth district chair of the equity and structure committee. Uh, I am joined here on this virtual hearing uh, by Councilman Christopher Burnett of the 8th District, Vice Chair of the Committee, by Councilwoman Danielle McRae of the 2nd District, Member of the Committee, uh, Sam Johnson from the Office of Council Services, staff to the Committee. I see we are also joined by Elena DePietro and Victor Alla of the Law Department, Avery Eisenstark of the Department of Legislative Reference, Bob Senemi from the Finance Department, and Matt Stegman from the mayor's office. I'm looking to see if we have other, and we do have other people on the call, so we will take that issue up when we get to the point of asking for public testimony. Um, Sam, are you gonna have to do that screen of how does the public testify? Why? Pardon? We might as well we might as well do that part now. We're gonna I'm gonna make a practice of just starting with that at the beginning of the hearing before we get into the meat of it. So I'm gonna turn this over to Sam to put up on the screen the uh, procedures that we're trying to follow for these virtual hearings. Uh, if um, going through for anyone who is calling in and cannot see the screen, uh, committee staff will coordinate the public testimony. So we ask for your patience. Uh, if you are connecting online uh, and you can, you can, if you can see this, you can also uh, use the raise hand function to indicate that you wish to testify. Uh, please state your name, though, before speaking after you're called on. Um, if you cannot see this because you're calling in, um, then we can't identify you by name. And so what will happen is uh, staff will unmute the call-in attendees one at a time. If you do not wish to testify when that happens, uh, just say that you have no comment. When you get unmuted, you'll hear two beeps uh, before you're unmuted, at which point you should state your name if you're interested in testifying or no comment if you're not. Uh, if we can't hear you, you'll be directed to call back in and try again. Um, if you are uh, on the call through video as well, but we're having trouble hearing you uh, because of a problem with your microphone, you can also provide testimony in the chat function. Uh, okay, so with that out of the way, uh, we are here this morning to, uh, to hear City Council Bill 19-0381, Charter Amendment, removal of elected officials. Uh, we have had several work sessions on this Charter Amendment already, including a one that we began last week before uh, realizing that uh, the public did not have access uh, to that hearing, uh, that work session. And so it was stopped and we are now doing that over. Uh, are there any additional issues to raise. Uh, I know that there are amendments from the sponsor that uh, will be put forward. Uh, is there any comment from the sponsor or, or anyone else about those amendments? I don't have anything else, Mr. Chair. I think we've uh, covered a lot of ground in the last uh, three hearings on this topic, um, but I don't, I, so I don't have any other questions. Okay, Elena has her hand up. So I'm calling on Elena. Hi, I just wanted to briefly say that I, I did try to um, respond to uh, Mr. DeFranco's um, 
materials that he sent to me and I sent you all an email um, relevant to that. So um, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there, I will now ask if there is any public testimony on City Council 19-0381. Uh, Sam, if you will go through, are there, actually, is there anyone who's calling in? I'm not seeing anyone. Okay, we have no call in. So if, so everyone who is participating in this hearing should be able to raise their hand uh, and unmute themselves, or at least raise their hand if they wish to testify. And is there anyone else? I'm seeing, well, Elena, oh, okay, I was going to say, the only person I'm seeing unmuted is Elena, uh, but that's been remedied. So uh, is there anyone else who wishes to testify? Because if not, uh, I would ask if there is a motion on uh, the amendments that the sponsor has put forth. I'd like to make a motion to move the amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion. Is there a second? Look, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I need to, I, I'll take this moment to recognize that we have been joined by Scott Davis of the Council President's Office. I'm sorry, Scott, if you were already on when I said we had no one from the Council President's Office, I hadn't looked yet in the not, not visible panelists. Um, Councilwoman McRae, would you wish to second Councilman Burnett's motion of his amendments to this charter amendment? No. Okay, um, then the chair will second them. Uh, the amendments are before us for clarification purpose. These are, should be available. I'm sorry, there they are in the back. Uh, these are the amendments that are dated uh, in the lower left-hand corner, uh, March 4th. Uh, they are offered by Councilman Burnett. There are three amendments, uh, all uh, referring to a verified petition signed by at least 20% of the qualified voters in Baltimore City. And uh, all in favor of the amendments say aye. 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 Any opposed, any opposed to the amendments? Opposed. Opposed. All right. Um, with two votes in favor and one opposed, the amendments pass. Uh, is there a motion on the amendment? I'm sorry, is there a motion on the charter amendment as amended? I'd like to move the amended uh, bill, Mr. Chair. All right. The, uh, the amendment is moved favorably as amended by Councilman Burnett and seconded by the chair. Uh, the chair votes aye. Councilman Burnett? Aye. Uh, Councilman Burnett votes aye. Councilwoman McRae? No. Councilwoman McRae votes no. Uh, the amendment passes with a vote of two to one and uh, will be on the on second reader at the next council meeting, which I believe is May 11th. Uh, okay, the next bill that we are hearing is um, yeah, so the ordinance of S admits charter bill 19-0379. This is a charter amendment to amend the ordinance of estimates to increase items of appropriation or add items for new purposes subject to certain limitations. Essentially what this charter amendment does it is, is it allows the city council to add money to the budget as well as uh, to cut money from the budget, which is currently the only thing that the charter allows the council to do during the ordinance of estimates budget process. Um, ooh, I've got a... 
I, well, I have a hand up from Elena. I don't know if that's still from last time or if this is now for the current uh, bill that we're on, but I am. It was from the last bill. I just wanted you to know that we, the law department would not be able to approve it for formal legal sufficiency. So just I, think so we, I think we understand that. Okay, Thank great. Um, what, um, so are, is there anyone who would, Matt Stegman has his hand up. That's, where, how, how do I see? How and, and, I, and, and Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to speak too. Victor, Victor wants to speak. Okay, so we'll take Matt and then Victor. Matt, you're up. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, express the concern. It does not appear that there are any members of the uh, general public who have uh, who have joined this hearing today. And uh, would you know? I, I know that you have moved the uh, the, the previous bill, uh, but just consider, um, you know, whether or not it, it would be uh, appropriate at this time to um, move these uh, when you know there has been, uh, I, I think, at least at the last couple work sessions, uh, you know, very limited uh, opportunity for public participation. Um, so so just, just something to, something to consider. Uh, just to be clear, uh, first of all, we are being covered on Charm TV, and uh, we know that there are members of the public watching on Charm TV. Um, were you expressing a concern that members of the public were not able to participate in these proceedings, as with last week when the link that was publicly advertised turned out to be incorrect? Or are you simply making an observation that nobody from the public has chosen to participate in this public advertised hearing? I, I have no reason to believe that the link does not work for this hearing. Okay, all right. Um, I, I would I would say in that regards that um, the city council has moved forward on items before it in the past when no members of the public showed up at our hearings. And um, while I understand that this is a strange and difficult time that we're in, uh, it is not necessarily um, a sufficient reason to let the wheels of government grind to a complete halt uh, as we continue to deal with legislative matters, which frankly have a timeline beyond our control. So uh, I thank you for the um, for, for raising the issue. Um, that being said, uh, I think we're going to Victor next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Oop, hold on. Oop. All right, now we, we're there. Okay, we've got Victor back, but we don't, you're still muted. There we go. Okay. Now we're good? Yeah. This is Vic Turvold from the city uh, law department. Uh, we have some, what I think are sort of innocuous amendments that we would like to uh, propose for this bill. We have. They have, are. Vic, have you submitted these amendments? In yeah, they are attached to my, to the law department's report. Okay. At the very last page. Um, and as I said, I think they're rather innocuous. I didn't do the bill report. It was Ashley Brown, but nevertheless, I'm here to speak on her behalf. Um, the First Amendment is right at the moment uh, you are you are restricted when you when you have the ability to eliminate items in the budget. Section 7A that appears on page two of the bill restricts uh, the city council from uh, altering amounts fixed by law amounts fixed by the fire department and amounts uh, for the payment of interest and principal on municipal debt. So we are saying what we would like is that when you go forward that you add language that would also exempt when you want to add items to the budget that you would also exempt the ability from um, uh, altering those items that you now see uh, in section 7A. And our, language, our 
language uh, at, attached to our bill report uh, gives you that language. If legislative reference wants to play around with the language, we're just happy to get the concept across at this point. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking through these amendments now. On page two, line 10, or by, insert one, and on the same page, strike in no event may on 14. Yeah, you're going to have to, frankly, you know, uh, you have to basically sort of put it, you know, start writing this out and seeing how it works. As I said, the, 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 the concept only is since you are restricted from altering those three items now in section 7a we are just saying that if you have the ability to also increase items in the budget that you wouldn't increase you would not increase those three items as well and that's all okay i get you i, I i'm following i'm following that so sorry can you can you walk one more time mr mr uh turbola sure. sorry so, <laughs> that's okay uh, look, right now, uh, your your power is to only delete items in the budget. But even if you deleted items in the budget, uh, Section 7A of the Charter, which you see on the top of page 2 of the bill, restricts you from changing amounts fixed by law or amounts for the fire department established by a board of arbitration, and finally, amounts for the payment of the interest and principal on municipal debt. All this First Amendment we're saying is just if when you have the authority to expand the budget, that is to increase items in the budget, that we would ask that you be not be able to alter the amounts that you see there reflected uh, in item 7A. So I'm, count, I'm sorry, Councilman, did you have further question? Um, be help, it would be helpful for me to have this. Uh, let me pull that up. Sorry. Uh, well, so I'm looking at the I'm looking at the bill, um, in a, particularly the portion of the bill which refers to the charter as it exists and would not be changed. And okay, and and Victor, I, I, I'm following I'm following part of your logic. Let me rephrase that. I'm following the part of the logic in terms of I I see what the intent is. Um, my question would be um, if the amounts for the fire department established by a board of arbitration and for the amounts for the payment of the interest and in principle of the municipal debt, I can certainly understand why the council would be prohibited from cutting those appropriations because you certainly, we have to pay our debts and if a board of arbitration has determined what the amount is we need to give the fire department and we have to do that um what i don't understand is would there I'm, I'm unclear on what is the need to prohibit council from putting more money in those budget lines I mean, I, I can see I can see why the charter would want to keep us from reducing it. I don't understand where the value is in prohibiting the council from saying we want you to pay this debt off faster, or we want you to give the fire department more money. Well. It's a it's a great question. Uh, and my 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 thought is I, I suppose at the end of the day we are being super cautious on what the law requires in each one of these particular cases. And uh, I mean I, I and I assume that we would leave that to the finance office to articulate a more rigid uh, requirement that I'm probably able to do at this point. Okay, well, let me let me skip quickly over to the to the technically the first one, but the the, the third of the points um, where the charter currently prohibits us from reducing any amount fixed by law. Uh, this conversation reminded me of a previous conversation 
I've had about this charter provision several years ago, where I asked, since the ordinance of estimates itself is a law, I mean, it's a it's an it's an ordinance that the that is passed by the mayor and city council. Um, what is the difference between the council reducing amount in the ordinance estimate and the council going into whatever law that fixed some amount and reducing it by whatever we want to reduce it in the ordinance of estimates. I mean, it would seem to be the same operation and the same expression of political will. Um, so I, I, would actually, I would actually question whether that provision needs to be in the charter at all. Because why? Why would you have? Why, why would you? Why would the council be prohibited from changing something that supposedly the council already said? Well, there are. I would assume, uh, you know, to the extent for for one, there are there are laws, there are local laws, and there are state laws that we have to, and so sort of stuck with whatever we have from the state and you can't fool with that. I would say in terms of what you're saying, it's it's true that there there is a will of the council in both both instances. But when you revisit a specific ordinance, you are visiting the entirety of the ordinance as opposed to when you're looking at the board by the board of estimates, you know, ordinance of estimates, you're looking at what hundreds of things that you're taking a look at and you're just saying, well, we don't like this particular issue. I, I think that's sort of divorced from the, the, the larger concept of what the actual bill uh, that may be establishing an amount uh, would be talking about. So well, I, I, it was just a cautious, it was just a cautious rendering, I think. How, how about this? Um, let me, can I, can I offer what I think is a reasonable compromise, which is um, I would like to add to these amendments uh, in, in page two, line one, after the word by include the words federal or state to clarify that in this case the charter is saying that the council cannot affect amounts that are fixed by some higher active law and then um, I would be happy to move all of the remaining amendments that would refer back to that as well. Let me, um, I'm, let me, uh, let's, I mean, Elena's on, Elena's on too, and she may have a, a different uh, view or a better view than I have on this. So Elena, if you speak, let her have it. Um, all I wanted to say with respect to the first question was that, um, you know, the, if you increase an item of appropriation, you also have to cut another item of appropriation. So there is a, you know, the finance department has developed this budget over the course of a year with all the information that is sent to them by the agencies um, and with a, a forecast of revenue and all those sorts of things that uh, come into play to, to come up with the final ordinance of estimates. And it seems ill-advised to, um, increase and cut items with when, you, when the council may not have all the information that finance was proved to at the time that they put those uh, items of appropriation together. So um, that, that was just the answer to your question that Vic was, um, not, didn't have uh, much to say about, so I just thought I'd chime in. Um, that, actually, those are, those are all um, very good points. And I would say with all, um, I'll do love and respect to uh, the, the, the Bureau of Budget and Management Research. And I mean that seriously, that's not a snarky statement. With all love and respect, I would say that if they do a comprehensive job of keeping the city council in the loop throughout the entire budget process, I don't see why that would be problematic at the end of the process. I think that the, I only, way, that. I think the only way that that's going to be problematic, um, potentially, is if we get to 
May and June, and we are for the first time learning details of what decisions were made in terms of where money is being allocated and where it's not. And we are in a relatively small period of time trying to negotiate. If the, council, if, the council, if the council were involved and engaged at a detailed level back in, say, the fall, when initial budget requests come in and kept involved and engaged through the spring, I don't think you would see the same problems. Well, I think as you, as, as this year shows, the, uh, you know, the changes that can happen on the, on the you know, spur of a moment due to unexpected um, events. So um, it's not always possible to be good. Yeah, a proper budget you know, showed BBMR can speak for themselves on that. Yeah, I, and, and, and I hope that no one either on this call or on the general public is, is somebody, somebody unmuted who's got a lot of background noise? I can't, Casey, I can't see the rest. Oh, no, I guess that's Sam. I can't see the rest of the, there we go. Somebody has resolved that. Um, what, what I was, what I was going to say is that um, I, I know that we're in a particularly difficult time right now in terms of the budget. And I know that the finance department is scrambling to deal with what I'm comfortable describing as a completely unprecedented event. Uh, and um, I expect that the council will be respectful of that in dealing with the changes that need to be made to the coming year's budget as a result. But I don't think that we should let that alter how we discuss or describe how the budget process should work year after year. And so, yes, there will be years where uh, there are unforeseen events that require sudden changes at the end of the process. I, you know, I'm, I'm not an unreasonable person. I don't think anyone on the council is in that regards. Um, but that's not, the fact that unforeseen circumstances can happen is not an excuse to not involve and engage the council significantly more completely throughout the entire budget process. That's kind of the point uh, I'm making. Um, I think that if the council is kept fully involved and engaged, the ability of the council to move money around more thoroughly at the end won't be as problematic because the council's input and the council's preferences would hopefully have been taken into account during the creation of the budget, which right now, frankly, doesn't really happen. And the whole point of this charter amendment is to provide a structural necessity for that to happen in the future. This is a uh, chairman. This is Victor again. Um, just looking at these three different items once again. I'm concerned about uh, your number three uh, amounts for principal and interest. I mean, we have bondholders out there who are you know, based, their income is based on what kind of money they get throw off by putting in municipal bonds. I don't know what it means to pay off the debt quicker, whether or not. I mean, so so you were you were talking along those lines, and that, you know that's what's and, and Victor, the, and Victor I, that's why I, I that's why I backed away from that. I said that. Um, I'm, I'm, I am not opposed to, to passing the amendments that the law department has proposed, which would address that issue. The only thing I'm suggesting is adding to the amendments that the law department has proposed a clarification that amounts fixed by law refers to amounts fixed by federal or state law which would be the, the ones that are happening up above our head, so to speak, 
and we should not be um, we should not be changing those amounts. And from my from my perspective, and Elena may chime in. I'm not going to object to that clarification on that one, but I would like the, I would like the department, uh, the finance people, to, to be speaking to that particular issue. Okay. Uh, who do we have? I, th I think Bob. Yeah, I'm 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 here. Good afternoon. So um, on the not on yet, the not yet. It's still morning. Give me. Give, I got 26 more minutes. Oh, okay. Good morning. Feels like the <laughs> afternoon already. <laughs> Um, so the, the way I, I view this first going back to the, the municipal debt question, I, I understand the intent of, uh, you know, the intent of the law is to make sure that we, we pay what is owed on our debt, which is a fixed obligation. So I understand that piece of it. And I think that part of the law is, is correct that we shouldn't be able to reduce that because there's, there's a risk that we would default on our on our debt payments, which would be a, a, a complete disaster uh, for obvious reasons. Um, in terms of fixed by law, uh, you know, the biggest piece of our budget that's fixed by law is our contribution to city schools, which is a state law. Yeah. Um, so by adding the language um, that it's state or federal law, I don't see a harm in that. Uh, but there could be other pieces of local law too that fixes certain parts of the budget although i'm not aware of any um currently that are like that that are large well then we get into the philosophical point that i raised of if it's a local law then in the same way that the council can change or eliminate any local law through the process of legislation um then philosophically speaking, if some earlier law passed by the council and signed by the mayor required us to spend a certain amount of money, then an ordinance of estimates that changes that amount is just a follow-up law passed by the council and signed by the mayor changing that amount. So I, I, I I'm 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 relieved to hear that you can't think of any local laws either that would apply in this particular situation. Well, can I can I clarify that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 no local law that I can think of that says the, the city shall spend X million numbers of dollars or X dollars per year. There are plenty of laws that uh, create what I would call unfunded mandates that require us to budget for something to meet the terms of the law, which means that internally, you know, we're reducing spending in other areas to meet those commitments. But what I, what I meant was, no, I mean no, on it, on it, Bob, I'm going to push back on that because we also have plenty of cases where the council has passed laws and the mayor has signed them that created these so-called unfunded mandates and the budget department has simply not funded them what, and what's an and they, example of that an example of that would be back in 2008 or two, you know, 2009 uh, we passed a consolidated assets for neighborhoods confiscated assets for neighborhoods grant program to be run out of the uh, mayor's office of criminal justice that would take a certain amount of money each year and provide it as community-based grants um, that would be vetted through the police department's uh, community relations commissions, um, specifically to with the idea of taking money that the city had confiscated from criminals and reinvest that money back into community-based programs to encourage neighborhoods to work with the police department on public safety projects. And that has been on the books now for over 10 years, and it has never, ever, ever been funded. So um, I'm going to say that if, if we don't have to fund things just because they're in law, I don't see why we can say that a law should keep us from making whatever funding decisions the council chooses to make. 
Yeah, and again, the point the point is a law a law can't say that you ha you shall spend a certain amount of dollars on a program because you know we've interpreted as the ordinance is the ultimate um, right. is the ultimate budget for the city. So even if there is a law that we feel like we can't that there shall be a program, if we don't feel like we can afford the dollars without making a uh, you know a, a reasonable cut somewhere else, that that's a judgment that goes into putting the ordinance together. Unless that law is a federal or a state one in which we legally don't have a choice. And that's why that's why I think that this clarification is um, is, is 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 suitable. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree on that point. Um, this is Vic again. Um, there's another, I have another piece that of, of an amendment. If, I don't know if we're done with this conversation, but if there's another amendment that I want the brother wants to offer as well. Oh, is, that's not already in your report? It's, no, it's in the report, but it deals with uh, the very last couple pages uh, dealing with supplementals. You have brackets under news, uh, uh, unanticipated grants, and material changes. Uh, once again, starting on bottom of page two and going into three, where you're basically saying you're allowing supplementals to go through without the Board of Estimates oversight of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that's a, a problem. The Board of Estimates is a, the fiscal watchdog of the city. If you're oh, gonna... Technically, that's the controller, but we can have that conversation later. Uh, well, uh, bottom line, uh, <laughs> That we have these supplements, you know, if we're talking about tens of thousands, it's probably not too big of a deal, but all of these supplements goes into millions of dollars. And the idea that we wouldn't have the Board of Estimates taking a look at that uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So we're trying to, so we would, we would, we would uh, amend the ordinance to have those brackets taken out and allow the Board of Estimates to do its job. So just out of curiosity, and this is a question possibly for Scott Davis, um, unless uh sam or anyone else on the call just knows this off the top of their heads right now do supplementals get referred to the the board of estimates for comment as um you know in terms of agency reports does anybody know that i i, I do so yeah. um the 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 board of estimates uh supplementals come come through finance and so uh, they have, they do have comments or they do have explanations on the memos that go to the board, um, you know, to explain what the supplemental is for and why it's needed. Yeah, I, I, my expectation is that if supplementals were introduced by the council, they're still pieces of legislation, they're still ordinances, and they would be submitted to agencies for their report and recommendation. Um, I can't imagine any reason why they wouldn't be submitted to finance. And if, I mean, if, if it was the preference of the administration to have them formally submitted to the Board of Estimates for comment, I don't see why that would be a problem either. I'll be very candid, I'm taking these concerns, not as a as concerns over a lack of ability to comment. I'm taking these concerns as a lack of ability to control. Um, that right now, because the charter requires supplementals to originate in the board of estimates, and the board of estimates is effectively controlled by the mayor one person not the finance department not not the larger financial watchdog of the city but the mayor decides whether or not a supplemental should be put forth and um and it is consistent with the rest of this piece of legislation to say that that power should not be held solely by the mayor and um there would still be plenty of opportunity for the finance department to comment as they can in any uh, legislative process and um 
I think most of us who are participating in this hearing are aware of times in the past where the finance department's concerns, um, when suitably well publicized by the media, have had um, substantial impact in cutting into the council's um, political and policy concerns about an issue. So I'm, I, 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 I guess I hear what you're saying, but, uh, and I can't speak for the other members of the committee, but um, I, I'm, I personally am only inclined to offer uh, the First Amendment, not the second one, from the law department. Okay. Councilman, can I can I clarify um, a couple a couple things? So, uh, we I, just a, a reminder: we wrote extensively in our original bill bill report about why we thought uh, the supplemental power, especially bypassing the board, is problematic. So. Um, <clears throat> I don't have to recount all the arguments there, and you're 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 accurate in that the finance department has a gets to submit a bill report just as long as the as, as well as the agencies. The issue is that a supplemental has to be backed by a legitimate revenue source, mm -hmm. and so having the board of estimates be that control guarantees that it first defers to finance as the as the um, as the agency that is at the mayor's disposal to make sure we vet those things and to make sure we only do a supplemental uh, if it's absolutely for a requirement where there were unanticipated expenses during the year or for a program that we know we can afford on a recurring basis. Um, having, having the council be able to submit individual supplemental bills with really no necessarily understanding of whether it can be afforded on the long term uh, we just think, you know, we wrote extensively about this. We think that's a recipe for for a lot of problems, a lot of fiscal problems. Well, I, I'm looking at the charter amendment itself, and the charter amendment does not make any changes to the rest of the definition or requirements for what a supplemental appropriation is. It only makes changes to whether the council can introduce them without the board of estimates pre-approval pre right. so so it, it, i mean it, it's not like the it's not like the the council can introduce a supplemental appropriation that just takes money from nowhere and creates it can. out of nothing sure, sure they we, can there would there what what I, I think that I think the bill sure you could you could the council could introduce a supplemental called additional spending for transportation for five million dollars and say that the source is general fund revenue and pass it and we could come and comment and say we don't think we can support that we do not have five million dollars of additional revenue to, to support on a going basis this particular spending plan and the council could vote on it and approve it without without you know, ignore the finance concerns. So I, I it, it's Oh, you mean, okay, so you're saying that it would be a disagreement over whether there really were excess revenues. Or ex exactly. And that's, and I, um, we think that's extraordinarily dangerous to have a, to have a bill introduced where, um, you know, you can just, it, it would, in our mind, it could lead to a process where you have multiple council people introducing spending bills for their priorities without a deeper understanding of where the money is going to come from. And those things could pass, even if the, even if finance objects to the bill, the council could pass those bills. So, and then, so, you have an, and, then you have, and then you have an appropriation where you're allowing an agency to spend additional money that doesn't exist. And so, so, so that's why, that's why the board of estimates control is so important because those requests get coordinated by finance to make sure that the only things that make it to the council are either absolutely necessary to close the year in balance or that it's a new program that we know we can support on an ongoing basis and that's why supplementals are generally so rare that we only have a handful of them each year so, so let me let me let me let me be clear about this are you saying that there is no way right now that a mayor can decide that 
the mayor believes there is going to be more revenue than the finance department believes there's going to be. And so the mayor has the board of estimates introduce a supplemental. I like, couldn't that happen now. Well, but again, again, just just practically speaking, you're I mean, the, the mayor is a busy person, right? He or she defers to his experts on a variety of topics. And so on financial matters, if there's something that he or she wants to spend additional money on, he will come to finance internally and say, hey, is this something we can afford on a going basis? And if finance recommends no, uh, you know, there's times we get overruled on that, but it's unusual that they would do a mid-year supplemental um, to add a new spending program when they had the, they had the, they had the ability to put that in the ordinance, um, in the ordinance of estimates for the budget. So is it possible? Of, of course Bob, it is. And there's a, there's a lot of things. And there's a Bob, lot of things. Is, that, is, it, is it your intention to assert that the council is not busy people? Or is it no, your no, no. To, or is it no. your attention to assert that the council is not capable of listening to the experts in the administration? No, no, that is not that's not right. what we're saying. And that's my point. My point is your 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 concern, your concern as you've laid it out, clearly presupposes that the mayor will act rationally, but the council may not. And I don't know how to have a uh, that well I, I, don't, I don't think Phil that I don't think that's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is there is more danger, there is more danger in a process where you have 15 members across a with a variety of different uh, very diverse districts and different interests and different um, things that they're interested in to be able to put a spending bill forward without understanding where the money is going to come from and that bill could pass. And it could still be vetoed by the mayor if it's really unreasonable. Of course. And, and until such a time as the charter is changed, it becomes very, it's very difficult for the council to override such a veto, right? Now, you'd have to get, you have to get 12 out of 15 members, at which point I think there's some, I think there's a legitimate question of if a super majority of the council representing all those different diverse districts feel that the city's policies should be something other than they are then there's a legitimate question in a democratic society of why that is considered dangerous and not simply a different policy I, I agree with everything you said, but it still it still is pre, it, what pre, it's pre, it's it's based on having additional revenue available. And what we're saying is that there's no control, there's no control. The council doesn't have to confirm that there is revenue available to add appropriation and add spending to an agency. If I if, if, if I may, so let me, let me, it, it's we're not we're not saying that one side of government or the other is busier or less rational or more rational. We're just saying it's a very big risk when you open up uh, the possibility that anybody can put in a spending bill and there's a possibility that those things could pass. Whereas if you have the board of estimates control, you at least know that finance has vetted it before it got uh, proposed. Ah, well, okay. So let me ask you this and, I, and, I, and, and I'm not, I don't know exactly how to now i'm just okay i'm just going to say it this way and we can figure out later if there's a if there if there was a more tactful way to, for me to have said it right now if the mayor disagrees with finance on whether a particular policy should go forward and whether a supplemental needs to be enacted in order to fund it Right now, if the mayor disagrees with finance over that, as you said, hopefully the mayor listens to the mayor's experts, but sometimes the experts get overruled and it moves forward. The difference, I think, between what we're describing is that when that happens, that's generally behind closed doors and that disagreement happens on two floors of one side of this building and no one else knows about it 
because the people who work in the finance department are solid governmental staffers who they're not, they're just trying to make sure government works as well as they can. So if the mayor decides this is what we're going to do, we just figure out how to do it. The problem is that relationship doesn't exist between finance and the city council, where we talk about stuff and we talk about some of it behind the scenes and we talk about some of it out in public like this. But there is no point at which if after much discussion and debate and reasonable exchange of, of information, the council says, yeah, no, we want to do this, the finance department feels overruled because under the current structure, we can't just do that. Yeah, I think I think you're I think there's one key point that that's being missed here is that okay. you're 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 correct when when we discuss something internally with the mayor there are times that you know we'll make a recommendation and say we don't think the money is best invested in this program or that program and the mayor will say no or, or and say you're overruled but it's still based on a a estimate of what the city can afford what our revenue picture looks like mm -hmm. And so if, if he says, you know, like, and currently if the mayor says, I overrule you on this, we say, okay, you want to spend 2 million on that program. We're going to have to make up that 2 million Somewhere other else. ways, other ways. And we'll, we'll come back with some options about what we could, how you can make that up with this particular bill. The council can do the adding with this particular provision. They can do the adding, but they don't have to cut at the same time. Yeah, we do. Not, 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 not in the supplemental bill. Oh, not in the supplementals. Exactly. Exactly. You can add spending. You can add appropriation with a revenue source that is, that is, that is, that is not real. And again, we're saying that that's a dangerous proposition. Okay. Vic. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add. I mean, the, what, for one, it, your your conversation about the mayor. It, it is the board of estimates. However, that's composed. It's the board of estimates that makes these decisions. And number two, the Board of Estimates is under the charter formulating and executing the fiscal policies of the of the city. You know, what you're suggesting, I'm not, I don't think we would be allowed to sign for formal legal sufficiency because we are basically draining away the power of the board. We're talking about expenditures of millions of dollars. We're going to be draining away the board's ability to determine where that what 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 that spending is going to be. So uh, you're, you're on a you're on a real hard point here, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right. You've convinced me. Is there any other comment or questions about the law department's amendments to nineteen dash zero three seven nine? All right. Do we have? Any comments or questions from the broader participants? No. All right, then um, I would like to move the law department's amendments to 19-0379 with the inclusion of um, an additional amendment, which technically would be Amendment 1, but I think we'll make it Amendment 3 just because it's less trouble. Um, on page 2, line 1, after the word by, insert the words federal or state. And with that addition, I would move the law department's amendments. Are there, is there a second? I'd like to second, Mr. Chair. Uh, moved by the chair, seconded by Vice Chair Burnett. Uh, all those in favor of the amendments vote aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Any abstaining? Councilwoman McRae? Excuse me, I said ah. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that, thank you. All right, then with three votes in favor, the amendments are approved. Uh, is there a motion to move this bill forward as amended? I'd like to move the amended bill, Mr. Chair. Uh, so moved by Vice Chair Burnett, is there a second? Seconded by the chair. Uh, the bill is before us as amended. Chair votes aye. Councilman Burnett? Aye. Councilman Burnett votes aye. Councilwoman McRae? No. Councilwoman McRae votes no. Uh, the bill moves forward by a vote of two to one and will be on the uh, council's agenda on second reader on May 11th. Uh, if there are, is any other business before the council, this, I mean, sorry, before the committee, this is an appropriate time for people to let us know. Otherwise, I will uh, adjourn this work session. And thank you all very much for joining us for this hearing and work session of the Equity and Structure Committee.